This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. So like I said, the closer to Pesach, the more people, it always works. At night, men like going to Shirim. The Hashem is Baruch. The truth is, is, how could you not come? Shalech to the Again, Karas to the Rav, Rav Weinfeld, for opening up the door. So why does it, this Medrash is open? So many different venues of Limit Torah and Chesed and so on. Um, Shabbos HaGadol means a lot of different things for, for different people. For some it's the hotel Shabbos, for some it's the Shabbos before the hotel, for some it's the Shabbos after the hotel. For some it's the Shabbos that they were waiting for kids to come home from Eretz Yisrael. It means a lot of different things. And there's probably no two Shabbos HaGadols in our lives that uh, means the... Uh, but it means the same thing. It's not going to be the same for any given individual. I want to try to approach that from a, perhaps a little bit of a different kind of a perspective. Someone asked me this, Shaila, today. We, we try to do things different by the Seder. Why do we do things different by the Seder? What's the purpose of it? To get the kids to ask, why is it different? Correct? Correct. <coughs> So here's the Shiloh that someone asked me, and I'm not quite sure what the answer is. So why do we teach children what we're going to do then? So obviously they're not going to ask, why are you doing different? You're doing exactly what the Rebbe taught them to do. So we shouldn't tell our kids a thing about the Seder. We shouldn't tell them one word about the Seder. They should come home, and they should see, what? Why are we eating vegetables before the... Oh, we're going to ask you. Why are we sitting, you know, lean to the side? That's the whole point. So what do we do? From the morning after Purim, this kid in pre-nursery today, there's already pre-pre-nursery, and pre-pre-pre-pre-nursery today, they even have a, a nursery for, even before the child is born, it's like we go all the way back, you know? Right? So the day after Purim, it already starts. You know, the Manishtana tape blaring away, and every kid knows every single part of the Seder, and every kid Chazrin, and every kid makes a Haggadah. Today, Rebbe's have to be printers. Every kid makes a Haggadah and writes Torahs, and we're busy stapling. And we have the whole Seder down packed, and we know exactly. Now, if the father would come home, and he, and he would do things normal, the kid would say, but why are you doing it different? You're supposed to... Something, something is wrong here, right? Am I making myself clear what the question is? Why do we teach the kids what to expect? So then they're not going to ask that it's different, and this is what they're going to see. Somebody told me about a certain Rosh Hashiva, that he has a psaminic, that uh, some people have this psaminic. They put the kaira to the other side of the table, the opposite side of the table of where the person is sitting. Again, so the children should ask, why are we doing it? So he said, uh, he comes, and he has a new son-in-law, and he, everyone's really, you know, they, they pick up the kaira, they take it to the other side of the table, and the son-in-law goes, why are you doing that? <laughs> and he jumps up and goes, Baruch Hashem, for 25 years, you know, somebody finally got a Kedesh Yisrael, somebody asked, you know, why are you doing it? I didn't have it for years, he said. So, uh, it's like I once saw a song, you know, we're getting together Friday night, and uh, there's going to be like a butter, like a little bit of a tish, and afterwards, it's, there's going to be spontaneous dancing. You, how do you put on a sign that there's going to be spontaneous dancing, right? Isn't that supposed to be you're so charged and you feel so good that the simcha breaks forth, you know? But you know beforehand there's going to be spontaneous dancing? How does that work out? So maybe things change. Maybe today it's supposed to be uh, Maybe things are different. Rav Schwab used to say, he doesn't know how the Higarita... Uh, the, it's supposed to be the Gadot la Mincha today it's more of a Gadot la Vicha really because the kids are saying the Torah to the Father it's supposed to be the other way around so I was just thinking um, two different Mahalcha one Mahalcha is a BMS BMS what a person sees has an impression on that even if the child knows you're going to do something different from beforehand and even though he was chazering this, and he knows the reason you're doing it different is that he should ask. But Misa, when he sees it, it has an impression on him. It makes a rosh among Much as you know about it before. The Altaf and the Vardik, they say before he went to a big gavir for money, he checked himself into a first class hotel for a night. 
the most fanciest hotel in the world. That wasn't really very Navardic style, right? In Navardic, they had one suit, one decent suit, when a bachar had to go for tachlis. But then they realized not all bacharim come in the same size. So there was one... Uh, there was one extra large suit, and there was one medium suit, and there was one uh, portly. What's it called? The uh, smaller size, right? Portly is big. Right. There's one like one, you know, because there was a, there was a, there was a, there was a large and a, and a medium and a small. And you took your suit and you went on the date. You, know, and you came back. You hung it up because for Kerti, the whole sheet was you shouldn't uh, work against it. So they say the story that a bacher came and he saw a girl and it wasn't really much and. As he got up to leave, a button popped off the suit, so she wanted to run back to give it to him. So the father said, no, no, the next size medium, that's going to come. He said, well, we'll give it to that guy, we'll put it into the pocket, you know, uh, that's going to come. But so the Alta of Nevardic checks into a big, beautiful hotel. Why does he check into a, into a big, you know, in Nevardic, the, the, the father learned Nevardic. So they said, they, they would train people, the Alta of Nevardic would look to see what's your shvachgeit, where do you have a weakness, and then he would train you to go just the opposite, to break it. So you should be ready for anything. So Rabbi Yaakov Galinsky said, you know, he had a big fear of, of Beis HaChayim. He had a tremendous fear of cemeteries. And he had a tremendous fear of the middle of the night. So he wasn't, uh, so he, I don't think he was there at the times of the Alta from the So he was told to go in the middle of the night and toivel himself in the mikveh where they toivel the mason. Break the pachat, see, it's nothing. So he went, and he says, but they used to, he, he said, he, he remember as a kid, he heard legends that in the mason come and they toivel themselves in the mikvah that they were toivel in a chatzais. And here he was told to toivel himself a chatzais in this thing. So he goes into the water. He's like looking around. There's nobody there? Huh? Baruch Hashem. And suddenly, as he's about to come up from the water, he hears somebody coming into the water. You know? And he opens up his eyes and he sees this thing moving slowly toward him. And suffice it to say, he broke the record for the 100-yard dash, the Olympic sprint. You know? In less than 0.2 seconds, he said he was... He was back in the yeshiva under the table, and he saw there was another bacha there under the table. This bacha was shaking like a leaf. And he said to him, why are you shaking? He says, <laughs> he was just titling himself in, in the mikvah in the middle of the night. <laughs> there was a mess over there. When I went in, he said, okay, <laughs> just, it's okay. He says, we can both get out from under the table now. You know. So the guy was walking through a cemetery in the middle of the night, and he was, he was very frightened, and he met someone. He said, the guy said, why are you so scared? I said, I know it's a cemetery. I said, listen, when I was alive, I used to be scared too. Don't worry about it, he said. Listen, it's, uh, it's okay. Well, the mice, after all is said and done, all seriousness, they were ready, they were ready to take on the Nesiyanis of the Muhammad in a way that uh, not everyone did. So the Altaf in Avardik goes and checks into a first-class hotel. Why did he do that? Because he didn't want to be in the spoil from the person's money when he came to the Gavir's house. They said, anything that you see for the first time, you have a spiralist from. Second time, you don't have such a spiralist from. Not, not such a Rolls Royce. Huh? First time you see it, it comes running. Afterwards, it's a pain in the neck to park in Bar Park. You know, it's, it's a, it, everything else loses, it's a spiralist. But I can't tell you anything about it. You know the story, the person had a Rolls Royce. And he's driving around, he wants people to see. And there's a there's yeshiva bach there. And anyone, anyone remember the Dodge Dart? Remember the dark? That was the yeshiva shakar of our, right? We're not going to reveal our age over here. Right. So he pulled, yeah, he had a dark. And we had a dark. Right, right, right. So uh, he pulls up the alongside his Dodge Dart and he says, ah, Look at I have a Rolls Royce. He goes, I have a Dodge Dart. And he says to him, My car, you know. He says, It has this, it has that. It goes, My car also. You know, he, every, so finally he says, Look, my car, I lean back and it's not much like a couch. So he goes, my car, I give it a zet, so the whole seat comes back and full collapses. That's a total bed. Your car doesn't go down all the way. <laughs> He's all upset. Huh? My car's better than your car. So he calls up the Rolls Royce dealer. He says he wants to have the bed come down all the way. They order one from England. The whole thing with a lift till they have it installed. And the insurance company is asking him to do it. Finally, he has a whole bed installed. He's driving around. He wants to find this bacher in the Dodge Dart to show him. You know, and he's driving around, he's driving around. Finally, he meets the button, he sees the car, and beep, 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 and the window's all cloudy, beep. Finally, he rolls down the window, he goes, please don't bother me when I'm in the shower, he says, you know. He's, he's supposed to, I don't have one. Okay. So the first time you see something, you're in a spoil from something. So the, the Alta and the said, you know. Uh, the, the, uh, somebody told me, the one said the story, I don't know about, the, that in, in the Miri Yeshiva, they, when a Bacha went on a date, they would put $100 in his pocket. 
today that will get that will get him the coke in the lounge. But in those days, that was a lot of money. Even though you knew the hundred dollars belonged to the yeshiva, probably the only hundred dollars that the yeshiva had, and you knew you were going to leave it in the pocket, you were going to give it back to the office. But the idea was, if you had a hundred dollars in your pocket, you had a the middle of your confidence was more, and you were built up. So the, the tivius of a person is we're in a from what we see, and that's we, we, we don't. The child knows, he knows you're going to do it. But uh, he's still in the spall from Still in the spall from it, he's not, he's not moved by it. They say about, uh, that this story is definitely not true, but to one of the people, that, Miriam Webster, I guess he was a man, no? The one that wrote the dictionary, that they once caught him, he was in the bank, he was stealing money. <coughs> the other night in the vault, they, boom, they opened up the vault, he's there grabbing money, and the policeman says, Mr. Webster, he goes, I'm surprised. He says, no, no. You're shocked. I'm surprised. He says. If you want to use the words, right? The, the, there is a spilus when you see. He may not be shocked, but there's a spilus every time you see something. There's a, the tivius is that there's a spilus. But perhaps there's another nakoda. Maybe in a deeper sense, what we're teaching the children is okay that even the surprises in life we should know were planned out from before. That lest the kid come home at night and say, Uy, what happened today? You know, when I'm today was also a protest. But nothing like this ever happened to me before. It was Bashar, but nothing like this ever happened to you before. No, today something happened that was totally out of the plan. Today something happened that was totally out of whack. Today something happened that could have never happened like if it was part of Ashgach. No. Today it was Bashar, that something should happen, that should shock you. That was also part of the Ashgach. And that's why we're teaching children to be surprised. We're teaching children that even the thing the father does, strange, even the, the unexpected things in life is also a chaylik of the ashgacha. That's what we're teaching the children. I'm not in a spall. My Rebbe said, the father's going to do this. That's right. And in life, when you see strange things, the, the, the Adoin Ha'aylam said that it should be this way. If not, it, would have, it wouldn't have happened. That is also a chaylik of the ashgacha. Mention this. The Gemara says in Masech is Chagiga that uh, the Sultan went out to get someone uh, to, to bring a certain Miriam. It's time for her to die. And he brought the wrong one. Brought the wrong one. So they didn't know what to do with those extra years. They couldn't send her back. Oh, whatever that means. So the, the, what Reb Tzadik says, whoever this person was, it was such a side in Shemayim. It's not Bashar. What do you mean? Sutton next to the wrong person? Somebody died. Oh, it was Bashar. No, it's not Bashar. The fairy of Gemara. The Sutton can make a mistake. Kill the wrong person. He says here there was even a big, bigger Hashgacha than under normal circumstances. It was such a big Hashgacha that even the Sutton couldn't know who he was taking. That's what Sadiq says. So it's not Bashar. The Sutton goofed. It's even the Sutton himself couldn't know who he was taking. But he took the he took the, he took the right person whose time had come, whatever that whatever that Indian is, to understand that even in, in the surprises there's there is hashgach whether we understand it or we don't understand. It. People ask me sometimes, you know, a lot of uh, chasanim and so on. How, how did you make all the weddings that you made? You mean financially? Yeah, and I answer them the truth. I don't know. No, but you did it. How did you do it? I don't know. It happened on its own? It didn't happen on its own, but I cannot tell you how I did it. Except I was Maimon B'Amun Shalema that the Rabbani Shem gave me this child to marry off, and I went out there, and somehow things came together. And I can tell you, I have gone to weddings, and I knew I was $4,000 short. For, I, mean, I wasn't totally psyched. I was and I, I, I went to the wedding, and, and I had a yid came over to me and uh, gave me three thousand dollars. And somebody else came over to me and said, "You know, years ago you learned with my kid." And I got, and my, I had the money to the penny of uh, of what was there. So you're going to ask me how I marry off kids? They marry themselves off. But I had to just put put everything into play. I had to make believe like I was doing it, and I had to put it into play. Rabbi Aaron Cutler, Zechel Sadik Levracha, once got a ride with someone, and he got into the car, he saw there was a steering wheel on both sides of the car. What's this, a co-pilot? What's this? Co-pilots are dangerous. So Rabbi Aaron told him, 
No, that that wheel is not that steering wheel is not connected to the steering mechanism of the car. Just in those days, your child was allowed to sit in the front. And male, the kid likes to play this way. The kid, uh, he thinks he's steering. So I say, okay, turn right. So the kid turns the wheel, which is not connected to anything. And I turn my wheel. The kid thinks he's driving. So the Baron said, you're making a mistake. You also think you're driving. <laughs> and the Baron Shalem runs the thing. We had, I remember in, uh, we had a, uh, there's a mechanic in, in White Lake. I used to use him. Up, I forgot his name. It's up, up, up a windy dirt road. Big guy came out of real country, you know. Guy came out he wear. He didn't own probably one shirt that wasn't sleeveless, you know. Came out with his big muscles, wild hair. He had his big smile, and he was a mechanic. And he told me he built his house. He built it on his own. He single-handedly built the house. He only had someone help him pour the foundation. This guy was Oig Melech older brother. He was huge. He had cows walking around, and he had this big tractor, I remember. Huge, big tractor. And he's sitting on top of his tractor. He looks like a Kazakh on, on, a, on a huge horse. I'm telling you, he's a pachan of anyone out there. And he would come, and he had a lift. It wasn't a hydraulic lift. It was like semi-hydraulic, but basically he had to pull it on a pulley. He would push the car onto the lift, and it would, ah, 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 that's how he would like pull the car up with some kind of a semi-pump. It wasn't a full, uh, just muscle power. And uh, so I come to him once, and he's sitting on this huge tractor, and he's holding this little kid, and I guess it was his kid, little pitsy kid. And the kid is like holding onto the wheel, and he goes, Look, Dad, I'm driving! You're driving, yeah. You're your big, huge father sitting over there with this big wheel on this huge tractor, you're driving. So we think we're driving. We think we're driving. But the Etzem, things are happening on our own. And even when we're machadish something, and even when we do things that are different, you think that the one should... The one who made you do things different. The famous story of Yeris and Ibishes was coming to the opening of a, of a, of a cave. Not a cave. The, the king went over to him and they were entering the, the walls of the city. It was a big door and a little door. So the king said to Rabbi Yenison, write down on the paper which door I'm going to enter through. The big main door or one of the side doors. So he wrote down a piece of paper. And the king starts going toward the big main door. He goes, no. He's probably going to write it, go through the big main door. I'm going to go through the side door. He starts going through the side door. And he goes, no, if Yenis is going to think, I'm going to try to outsmart him. They're going through the side door. So, Manela, I'm going to go through the main door. He's going to think, I'm going to think that. So, Manela should go through the side door. So, Manela should go through the main door. So, the side door is circular reasoning. Finally, he has someone break open an opening, and he goes through that. And he opens up the paper, and Yenis writes, you're going to break open an opening, and you're going to go through that. The surprise that you have for someone else is also a chalik of the hashgach. The mistakes are also hashgach. Because in our eyes, they're mistakes. That's what we're teaching the child. So, Dr. Chaim Akadosh, if you see the first piece over here, Vatikohel Aeda. So, the Archaim Akadosh wants to know what the lotion of Vatikohel is. Vatikohel is passive. Right? Vayakel means gather them together. I don't know what the Ovar of Ayakel would be, but Vatikahel means they were gathered. What happened over here? Ulai, says the Yerachayim, Kaddish, the first Peshat, is Kiberoisa, Maisa, Moshe, when they saw what Moshe did, Shalokach, Aaron, Ubanov, Abagodim, Nikolu, Meatz, when they came on the road. The Moshe didn't tell them to come. O Yerotzel Hadiyah, or, the Pasuk wants to let us know, that there was a great nest over here. Sheikh Zikam Hamokoim Lachol Yisrael. The place was big enough for all of Klal Yisrael Bepesach Elmaid by the opening of the Elmaid. Kamashadosh Shechazal Bepasik Hakel. That there was a nest. This was one of the places where it was Miut Machzik Asamaruba. That all of Klal Yisrael fit in by the opening of the Mishkan. But Kan Yedi Hakasiv. The Pasik is letting us know Shekainah Yataka was that way. That's why it says Vati Kohel. But do you understand how many vatikahels there are in our life? We look back and we say, how did I get through it? How did, how did I do that? I, 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 sort of, I look back, I don't want to get too personal, but there certain instances in my life I look back and say, how did I get through that? How did I do it? It, it happened on its own. I know I went through a guise. There were so many shocks, so many surprises. How were I able to deal with it? Vatikahel, it happens. And I think that the Rebbe wants us to take the wheel doesn't want to sit back now to take the wheel. Turn the wheel. But I want you to know you're not really the one that's turning the wheel. And I once heard this. If you look at the simonim of the Seder, one is we take the bull, take the 
bull by its horns, and then the other is, and it happens on its own, but not really the one that's doing it. There's Kadesh, we do that, we go out for Kedusha, Urchatz, we get washed, it's also a passive washing. There's Karpas, yeah, hard work, we're there. The Yachatz, the Hashem cuts away half, puts it away for later. There's Magid, a Mem at the beginning of the word is the opposite of passive. A Mem at the beginning of the word means to project. Right? Whenever you have a mem at the beginning of a word, when the mem is not part of the shayrish, it means to project forward. The, the mazik is the one who destroys. The nun is to receive. A mazik is the one who destroys. Nizik is the one who gets destroyed. Malva is the one who lends money. The, the, the mishaleach is the one who sends somebody else. The migarish is the one who divorces. The mikadish is the one who is mikadish. Magid means I get out there and I force myself to daven and to learn and I get washed. Moitzi matzah may not be in the mood. I have to be moitzi the matzah. I have to get out there and say, let's go. I'm machaven, whether I understand it, whether I don't understand it. I got to do what I have to do. And then there's mara, you know, just when I real, feel I reached my inspirational heights, you know. What, what is the Bansham doing this to me? If I, today I had such a good day. And then this kairuch, you take that mara and you wrap it in the matzah and you say, one step forward. A half a step backwards, one step forward, three steps forward, one step backwards. You know, the stock market crashed many times over the years. Still, if somebody kept his money in the stock market consistently, he earned 7 or 8 percent. Kim, you move on. You put it all together. And suddenly, when you say to Banish, I'm going to keep going, I'm not going to give up Shulchan Aruch. Something is all prepared for you. Then suffering, you have to stop putting, it's not going to last this way. Banish gives us breathers, the Banish gives us recesses. But suffering, you got to start putting it away. For the future. And then Beirach, Hashem benches us. And then Howl. So the whole Seder, and then there's Nirza. At one point it's, okay, we've reached our Madrega, we've reached our ultimate Messiah in life. We keep doing what we're doing, and what happens afterwards, happens afterwards. It can't be an Eivachach. I'll tell you, yesterday, my son-in-law, my daughter, came from Eretz Yisrael. So I, I, I mentioned, it came with this Russian airline. It beats me. But I guess when you're in Kyle, you think of things differently. You know, I went fly to, I remember yeshiva, yeshiva guys, you know, <laughs> we camp for good, they were like, uh, can, can you take us to Lakewood? I'm not going to Lakewood. I'm going to, all right, so I'm going to Bar Park. So we'll go to Bar Park. You say, you want to go to Lakewood? Okay, we'll get from Bar Park, we'll get to Lakewood. Okay? Like, that's Buckham, you know. Okay, you know okay. Going to Philadelphia? No, I'm going to Boston. Okay, so they go to Boston, you know. <laughs> yeah, certain Buckerish are kind of a thing, you know, like, uh, It'll go through Russia, okay? Go through Russia. Anyway, they're, they're, they're traveling for like 24 hours with the baby. So they're, they're supposed to land at 1.30. So I, uh, I figured a Russian airline's going to be late, no? That's what it was. The guy told me during the war, the, the used to come to the train station, the German trains used to leave on time, perfectly. During the war, they left one or two minutes early. So what's going on over here? They told me it's a war. You have to leave early. And the Russian trains were always an hour late. During the war, they were four hours late, five hours late. What's going on? It's a war. During the war, everyone goes back to their nature. Anyway, so I call up the airline, I actually get to speak to a human being, and they tell me the flight is on time, Siminish Git. So for me to leave Yeshiva to get there on time, I would have to leave, I figured I'd have to, if, I, if, I'm gonna, if the flight is supposed to land at 1.30, it takes them an hour to get out, I want to be there at 2.30, I think I've got to leave at 2 o'clock, but I'm supposed to be in Yeshiva to 3. So I get someone to cover for me, and I'm saying, should I, shouldn't I, should I, shouldn't I? If I leave at 3, the earliest I can get there is 3.30. So I say, you know what? I'm leaving at 2. It's a big Indian, bruchem habayim, to your kids. If not, it would cost me money for a car service. You know, I have other cheshbonis that I had, the sham So I have people covering me, and I leave yeshiva early, I leave at 2. That's chatoy ani maske. And I had this guilty conscience, but my so far it's smooth sailing, and I'm on like by Pennsylvania Avenue, you know? And um, my son-in-law calls, doesn't have a cell phone, because it's really cell phone, it's just borrows on the phone, I say, GPS says 10 and 10 minutes, I'm there, stand on the platform outside, you know, shouldn't have to park, and I pick you up, and we go. And uh, all of a sudden, these, I should have shown it, you have like, if so they do this, there's like three construction trucks in front of you with the arrows, you know, all of a sudden they stop. These guys get out, they start fixing potholes, my mom's now they're fixing it. Two o'clock in the afternoon, and all the traffic is stopped. And it looked like, you know, you don't argue with a guy holding this big shovel full of uh, sm- sm- uh, whatever they asphalt. fix, asphalt, yeah. So I'm there, I don't know how long, 10 minutes. And when they finally do open up, they only open up one lane. Of course, I was on the other side of the highway and I had to inch in, you know. And uh, I get there and I was so, and I had no way of calling him back. And, it's, and I'm now 
running late by half, I told him 10 minutes, it's 20 minutes later, and I'm so tzedrudled that I forgot that this Russian airline comes into Terminal 1, and I'm used to going to Terminal 4, I go to Terminal 4, and I go, oh no, wrong terminal, and it's not, it's not like I can get out of the car and take the air train, you know. You ever try Canada Airport when you miss the terminal, what you have to do to go around to get to the thing, you know what I mean? You gotta go to Far Rockaway, to the White Shul, you know what I mean? And Davin Mincha, and then come all the way around, like the Long Beach or something, you know, I don't know how it is, and, and take a ferry across Fire Island, it's like you gotta go, you hope it's Sivuv on a Sivuv on a Sivuv, get more coffees than Simchas Torah. And when did I get there? 3.30. Just had I left Yeshiva at 3 o'clock, I would have gotten there 3.30. I said, you know, you know tell me, we're gonna, and, we're, and we're gonna say that the Rabbi Hashem doesn't run this world, right? That, uh, that he's not there. So we have to do what we have to do. And the Rabbi Hashem does his. Rabbi Hashem does his. Contrast, another story which I, you know, some of you have heard from me, but just to give equal time. I'm driving this guy to the airport. And he says, I, I don't, official, I don't want you to take me to the airport because you always get lost. I like your stories, but I don't want to be part of them. And I really have to make this play. It's a family member of mine, Versteitzer. So I was like, I'm not going to get lost. So I take him to the airport. I drop him off. And I tell him, uh, I'm going to go park, and I'll come up for you. So I'm driving down. And as I'm driving, so it says parking, okay? And it says exit. And it's on the same sign. So I assumed it meant exit for the parking. And I'm, I'm, I'm driving over there. And I don't know, somehow I'm, I'm, I'm exiting right out of the parking lot and right back where I started with. So I would have never done if I had to get right back to where I started with. I went in, into the parking lot, up the alley, and around back in front of the terminal. And the guy calls me a second before he goes, I left one of the suitcases in the car. I'm going to get the plane. I'll be right there. You'll never figure out how to get around. Stay outside. And two seconds I'm there. He goes, How? How'd you get it? I'm a shlomazel. What do you think? <laughs> so I remember thinking, well, so how, how do you have time for this? Like, you know, hey, you're running the whole world. You know, how do you have time for this? If, if we, we look to see the hashgacha that is in our life, and I think that that's the message more than anything else, that that is the message that we have to convey to children. That, you know, we, we're, we're only holding on to the wheel that doesn't drive. And you do what you have to do. Think about this terrible tragedy with the plane. It's not a joke. You know, we used to say a vark that uh, they say it from, from different uh, tzaddikim. How can chas v'shalom, if someone needs surgery, you ask a thousand people, which doctor? And you get protexia, and you always, a yid always travels to a different town. Because always the better doctor in a different town. Here, you go to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh, come here. You know, that's always, that's always, somebody else always has it better. You're going on a plane, your life is in the hands of the skills of that pilot as much as in the skills of the surgeon. So why don't we ask, right? Every year gets on, you try to you save two cents, you'll fly to Timbuktu. Guys go to Turkey, they fly out, you gotta save $20, you know? We, know? we don't ask who's the pilot, how much experience does he have, we never ask that. We don't know, anyone knows who the pilot is. You go to a doctor, take cheapest surgeon, and just take him. So the thought used to be, oh, but the pilot himself is on the plane. That's the difference. The surgeon is not under the surgeon. But if it doesn't help if the pilot himself is on the plane because the pilot is the problem, so where's the shmira for that? So I was reading the different reports about this, this, this horrific tragedy of human nature, and it was interesting. So it's going to change a thousand times. And this is what some reporter was writing, that the pilot walked out, and he realized something was wrong. He's trying to get back into the cockpit, and, and the co-pilot is not letting him back in. Now, he, so he writes, the pilot was trying to smash the door open, but because of 9-11, they made such secure doors that you can't smash in. He said, but even then, every pilot used to have a code how they could open every door from the outside in case, you know, in case he stuck outside and the guy inside having a heart attack. But since 9-11, they, they, they made an extra security measure that the pilot inside could outcode the, 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 the outside code. Because what if the guy's holding a gun to the pilot's head and says, open up the cockpit? So now he could press a button on the inside that locks the code that the one outside can't come in. So in effect, what happened? The real pilot couldn't get in because of the security measures that were taken because of 9-11. So, so, so you realize the, the, the ramifications of this. So was, were the security measures after 9-11 wrong? No, because we respond to the, to the trauma. If they broke into the cockpit, we do everything possible to lock the cockpit. And then what's the tzara? We lock ourselves, and then, then we lock the, the good guy out. So I ask you, in our lives, could we really protect ourselves? Can we protect ourselves? We'll do everything in the world to protect ourselves. Highest, the biggest security system in the world. And for all we know, we're killing ourselves. So at the end of the day, so we shouldn't try to secure things? Yeah, we try. 
But don't fool yourself for one split second that you or I can protect ourselves. Every day is a gift. Every child is a gift. Especially after the, the horrific tragedy of this week. Every moment is a gift. There's, there's no guarantees. Nobody knows where we are. One of the inyanim we want to give over by the Seder is that there are no surprises. That even in the darkest of times, it's a Kaddish Baruch Hu's Hashgachim. That Laila Kayoin Yoyer, that's, that's the Indian of Pesach. That night and day and day is night. The Biyatzim, it's all one thing. Zokta Rechaim Kaddish, as we see the second Rechaim over here. But Yokam Pari Laila, Pari gets up at night. Tamay Mori Laila, why does it say got up at night? So Rashi says he got out of his bed. What does Rashi say? He got out of his bed. So the Yimriyam says, his party, everyone's dying. Yeah, I got you Bedtime, you got you And then he takes his royal teddy bear, gets to bed. But the Rechaim HaKadosh says, why does it say, but Yochum Pari Laila? Yizbar al derech emorim zal, ki oisai Laila, that night, wasn't stam a night. Haya kiyoyim yoyer. Ketzachos hayoyim. It was like day. What does that mean it was like day? The Yidin saw that all the Tzoris and all the Chashkas they went through, None of it was that the Rebbe Hashem forgotten. It was all hashgacha. We're a masti lezeh, a remnant to this. But pasuk, we gather to live in chabi yoyimahu. Ki yechavin loymer she yagid loy gamnes halayla shenasa yoyim. When you talk to your children, we gather to live in chabi yoyimahu. Tell your child that loyla is yoyim. Tell your child. Then the shemayim there are no surprises. Down here there are a lot of surprises, pleasant surprises, and some surprises that are very very difficult for us to deal with. But up there in Shemayim, it's all Yom. It's all HaKadosh Baruch Hu's Hashgacha. V'shem HaTaymer, maybe you're going to say, Zok Tehela Garachayim HaKadosh, Ki Zorach Ar Balayla, that when the light shines at night, Derech Klal, L'Royim U'L'Tayvim, signs for everyone, L'Zei Oymer V'Yakam Pari Layla. Pari gets up and it's still night. Kishakamu Likri L'Moshe L'Aroin, Mona Hashem Meirasha. Shem kept away from the Rasha Oira this light. Why Yolayla, for him it was night. So you can have a time where you can be zoichet to see that the night is day. But you have to want to see it. If you want to see it, you can chap around and see that the night is day. If not, that same person that sees day, but somebody else is going to see night. Today is today's the yard site of the Shomer Amunim. The Baron Rot built the whole uh, Shomer Amunim. It's Yisrael. He saved for Shomer Amunim. He brings a story. That in Svast there was a terrible, terrible magefa, Rachmanulzlan, horrific magefa, and it particularly affected women, Rachmanulzlan. Women were dying, and uh, the, who stopped the magefa? He had the biggest mikabalim, the biggest sadikim, their tefillos hit a stone wall, and there was one person that was davening for the Ahmed. They didn't want him to daven for the Ahmed because he was a big amal aretz, but he davened for the Ahmed. He comes to Rafainu, zooms right through it. Such a time. So many Yiddish mamas, so many Yiddish daughters are fighting for their life. You're zooming through the Feinu. Comes to Baruch Aleinu, he's so choked up he can't get his voice out. He's crying, crying. Now you're crying for Panasa. Now we're crying for life. They wanted to stone him. Crying, he's so choked. Comes to the end of the bracha, he understood. He goes, he said it the way he's been saying it all his life. And he goes, Baruch Ata Hashem, Mevarech Hanoshim, he says. Instead of Mevarech Hashanim, he said Mevarech Hanoshim. Not tonight, he always said Mevarech Hanoshim. He always thought that's what you're supposed to say. He says the Megei Fustat. Says, for him, the Megei Fustat. He was maimin the Hashgach for him, the night is day. He was maimin the Hashgach Pratis. He understood that the Rabbi Nishlam is the one who's in charge of him. He's the one that can do it. He's the one that can knock out the Xero. You think they're not in Shemayim, they're not laughing at us, they're not laughing at our davening? You think we're only, you know how many Mavarech Hanashims we say? But if you mean it with an Aaron's kite, and you're, in, and you're pushing yourself the way you should, then things work out. Then the Rabbanisham answers our tefillahs regardless. Zakta Svas Emes quotes, uh, it's fascinating, Svas Emes in about the Chlal, the Indian of Shavash HaGadol. But he writes as follows. Pirish, quoting the Chedush Yerin, his grandfather, Ki This Shabbos is the end of the cycle of Shabbos of the year. And what happens this Shabbos is Ms. Asfin, Kol Hanun Shabbos Hashanah, all the 50 Shabbos of the year, Liskos Legeula, where we can be Zaycha to Geula. Every Shabbos we can be Zaycha to Geula. Mali Shami Yisrael Shabbos Echad, Miyad Negola. Shabbos is a time when we look back and we see, ah, oh, it all makes sense. It's all Geula. You have to be zaycha to see it. 
But we can miss it. We can miss it. This Shabbos is like another chance to chaperine all the Shabbos of the year. Somehow all the Shabbos of the year shine through this Shabbos. And the Mela where you blew it in any of the Shabbos throughout the year, you could have a tikkun this Shabbos. Let's say that's what people have to come to Shabbos. The gold rushes because they have a tikkun. They have a tikkun going through that. But we're all kidding us up. It's a very serious Shabbos. Just like there's the Nun Shari Vina. We eat Shabbos for Zaycha. Through your Zaycha to the, to the, to the Nun. And the, we're in the Nun Shari Tumah. The only thing that kept them from crashing was the fact that Friday night they got together, they had Shmira Shabbos. Vaitri says the second piece of here, also quoting the Chedusha Yerim. He says, My Zayda Higit, the Shabbos Agadol. He says, You know what the word Shabbos Agadol comes from? Shemash Bezgeis. Shabbos is a lotion of Shavas. It puts to rest. God oil, the gaiva that is in the past. Shemash Bezgeis, it takes away the gaiva, the godless and the godless, Asher Loy Lo, that isn't Apikadosha. Ki Shabbos ma'ila kol davo l'shay rasha. Shabbos brings everything to its shayish. Um and ichasai. The geyes mekayimai. Where does geyes belong? Rak l'shem molach geyes lavish. Ula kach ha Shabbos mesayeya l'adam. If someone goes through Shabbos properly, it helps him. Shaloy l'his guys that he should not be a balgai. So Shabbos HaGod was a lotion of Shabbos. It puts to rest the guy. I never really understood why after Miz Mashiach Yom HaShabbos, we always say Hashem Malach Geyes Lavesh. Because it takes away our personal gaiva, and we only look at the gaiva in as much. In other words, what, what does that mean? When does a person have gaiva? When he believes that he's in control. That's when a person has gaiva. When I believe that somehow, you know, hey, you got to come on to me. I'm the big boy in town. I'm the rich guy in town. Without me, no one comes through. The Gemara says the guy is in charge of the irrigation ditches. You know, he thinks he's the malaf. He's in charge of these dishes. No one uh, does anything without me. And that's hepach of feeling a shor sashchina. It's hepach simcha. It's hepach everything. And on Shabbos, we're totally mevatel ourselves. You have to be zaychet to it. The Shabbos of God was a special schooler of a total bittel. In the third piece over here, there are many pieces, he says as follows. Pesach umila mitzvah say. Pesach and Mila are both mitzvahs that say sheyesh ben karis. There's only two mitzvahs that say, right, the 36 creases. But there are only two mitzvahs that say, where if a person doesn't do the mitzvah, he's chay of karis. That's if he doesn't bring the carbon Pesach. He doesn't do bris Mila for shteitzach willfully. So Rav Shosh Kedavach always used to say, from the oinish of something, you see the kedusha. If the oinish of Pesach and Mila is karis, so then merub and the toiv, it's a hiskarvist to Hashem. But the Svasana says as follows Pasach Umila is mitzvah sasei she yeshbem karis. Umila, what are the two main Yetzaharas that a person has in his lifetime? Avoid the Zara and Arayas. Both are linked to Gaiva. A person is dressed classy, his Yetzahara de Arayas is stronger. A person is dressed classy, his Yetzahara to avoid the Zara. Call on his guards, kill the Arvid avoid the Zara. And that's Pasach Umila. Pasach Umila, who, who uh, Mila is the tikkun liyitzra the arayas. Sheyevshel hiskadesh, you can't have kedusha belis yata the shmaya. Bekoyach brisoy shechasan bifsereinu. U pesach and the carbon pesach who tikkun liyitzra the avoid zara is the tikkun for avoid zara. Lekach sama chaga matzos. Chaga matzos is near lolehem esechol esasalach. The Yitachin says this was Emes, Shalachin Achakach, Goli Lafan of Yisbarach Shemoy, Shaosh the Beis Hamigdash Licharev. The Abishta is going to know the Beis Hamigdash is going to be destroyed. The Lo Yasu Pesach, and the Yidden won't be able to bring a carbon Pesach. So right away, Nosan Koyach, the Anshik Nesak Dele, Levatel Yitzur, the Avaydazar. The Anshik Nesak Dele took away the Yitzar of Avaydazar. Because you have no carbon Pesach, you don't have a way of fighting the Yit. The Yitachin Gan came Loimer. Shabashonim Shabitlu a Pesach, look in your Tanakh and check your history. When the carbon Pesach stopped, that's when the Malcha Yisrael started en masse serving of Adazar. Lachin Nichshlu be Avadazar be me Malcha Yisrael. The Zois Iker Hashwach be Yitzias Mitzrayim, Shinis Battle Koyach Avadazar be Oilam. Parai was the ultimate Avadazar. I have ultimate control, I have ultimate power. Mitzrayim had to live on the Nilus. Without the Nilus, everyone we would die. There was no rain. And Paroi blesses the Nilus. So Araya went every morning to bless the Nilus. Now you and I know what he blessed the Nilus with, right? <laughs> and a guy once told me that he went to, uh, once told me that he read this. 
There's a local politician who went up to an Indian reservation. He gave a tremendous speech. And every time, when he finished saying something, he wanted an applause. And the people were screaming, Haya, Haya, Haya. He thought that was like, you know, bravo, bravo, you're so excited. The, the Indian chief wasn't there by the speech. On the way out, the Indian chief walked him out. When he was getting close to the car, he told him, Look, careful, he said, don't step into the Haya, he said to him. So all of a sudden he said, uh oh. Right? But Paroi had everyone believe that he is the ultimate power, the ultimate control. He's who he is. So Paroi's downfall is the Paroi that's within us. There was a Yidra Mendel Futafas who once said a whole story. He said he once went to the Rebbe and the Mesnagid said, Don't go! Don't go! He saw a little Tyra. And the Mesnagid said, Don't go! You're going to crash! Don't go! You don't even know where you're going! Don't go! The Rebbe doesn't even like you! And the Chassid said, Go! And the Mesnagid said, Don't go! And the Chassid said, Go! And the Mesnagid said, Don't go! And at the end I went, even though there were so many Meneas. So I said, Where were you with? The, who's this Mesnagid? He goes, I mean, I was the, the Mesnagid and the Chassid, he said. With, with, I'm, not, I'm not connecting the Snagit to Pari, but just in the context of that story. There, there's a Pari that is within all of us. The, the Rebbe Rebunim said, Daim on the hush of Lapikairis, that means a little Lapikairis that's in you. There's all a little bit of Pari in us that feels, if I can only take control, you know, the world is mine. And the world is not yours. You become Rachuk from Hashgacha, you become Rachuk from Akadish Baruch. Hu. And the Yidin, only after the downfall of Pari with Ezoichet to Tefillah, because Tefillah requires Hachna. B'zel Sha'amar, therefore we say, Mitchila Oivdei Avodah Zara Hoyavi saying, Val Yidei Yitzias Mitzrayim Upesach Nekra Yitzra the Avodah Zara. And once the Yitzar of Avodah Zara leaves, Vekarvanu Amakim Baruchil Avidasi. Somebody writes to the stipler, it's right, written in the Sefer, crying in the Igrasa, he says, I'm embarrassed to say, I'm a Yeshiva Bachar, I, 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 you know, I, I put on tefillin, and I learn, and I'm considered a top-notch bachar, grade A, and I know I have sveikas in the moment. Sometimes I think, is it Torah Emes? Is Harsina Emes? Is it all true? He can't live with himself. So the stipler said, you know, the famous Rebbe says, you really do have a moon, it's just blocked up. But he says, I'll tell you what to do. So he writes a couple of things. He says, first of all, you're thinking too much about yourself. You're too much, you, you're, he says, there's two kinds of Rishon Retire Mitzvahs, suddenly has fakers in Amunah, could be for two reasons, he says. Either you did, you did an Aveira that was like a real bomb, and as a result, that's a of Karas. And the Ramban says Karas means you get cut off from your Amunah. That could be. So it could be. Some, some people do an Aveira, and that's it. In the Shemayim, they just lock everything down, and he loses his Amunah. Most of the time, when you have a guy that's Shemayim Shabbos, and he eats Chont, and he eats Kogel, he does all the things that Orthodox Jews do. And he buys a new shrimal in one of the sales before Yom Tov. Does everything you know that Jews do, and and uh, he has sveikas and amuna. So the stipul says that comes from gaiva. The more you're a balgaiva, Kadosh Baruch says about a balgaiva, ain't aniva who yecholim lader keechad. I can't live together with a balgaiva. What does it mean? Hashem says I can't live with you. It means it means you begin to have sveikas and amuna. You don't you, you don't have the proper amuna you're supposed to have. So, 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 and it was the same. One, the stipul writes in the letter I counted up. X amount of times you wrote the word I, and I this, and I that. There's so many I's in your letter. It says, Malach HaMovis, Mali you know, That's where you are. So if you work on your Anova, Amuna will automatically come in. The second thing he says to him, that he should be careful with Shabbos, with the Zmiris of Shabbos. Shabbos brings back Amuna. Once you work on your Anova, Shabbos will fix your you're an Asayi in Amunah. Third thing he says over there, he says he has an Asayi to say Pashas Azinu. Say the words of Pashas Azinu. Because everyone's life story is in Pashas Azinu, so you touch on your element of your Nisham. And he says that, he also has to answer Oman Yehei Shmei Rabbah, because the Gemara says that, uh, even if he has within him a Shem, it's a Bavay Dezara, takes it away from him. It says also about Shabbos, Kol Shem, Shabbos, Kol Chasai, Filo Ebed Ebed Ezara, Kedar Enes, Shmeichel, and Loi. So again, but when we begin to think that we have control, the Rabbi Hashem leaves us. When the Rabbi Hashem leaves us, we have Sveikas and Amunah. What's the answer? Scream Amun Yehesh Merab. What's the answer? Shabbos. Whatever Mesiris Nevis you have for the covet of Shabbos, jump in and do it. Do it. In, in, in your own way. And, and Shabbos Hagadol is the Shechita of Avaydazar. It's when the Yidin took that Seh and tied it to their beds, and they didn't know what was going to happen, and they said, this is it. 
Whatever's going to happen is going to happen. The Vayner Shalom, we are totally undoing our controls and we're doing what we have to do. And I once heard of art, and maybe there's an MS to this. Okay, this week, year, it's not so Megaya because you have a, like almost a full week after Shabbos Agadl. But many people, where do they eat Shabbos Agadl? In the basement. They eat under the table. They eat on crates. They eat on, on, on you know, wherever we are. So maybe that's the Indian of Shabbos Agadl, you know? You are where the Vayner Shalom sends you. You have a big, beautiful house and you're eating in the closet of the kitchen. That's, that's the only place your wife will let you in. But, but so, you know, the Shabbos of is a total bittel. It's like the Yasasem that says, Shavas of the God. It's, it's this Nikud. That wherever I are, that's where I am. Today is the yard site of Rav Meir Dun Plotsky, the Klei Chemda. On the video of the Chavetz Chaim, it, it's, uh, there's different opinions, but, but I, I pretty much think if you look at it, you see him there. And he was there. As a matter of fact, he was the keynote speaker. He closed it, and he's the one that said they should get up and say Shema Yisrael and, and, and be makabal Omach Shemayim. That was his idea, and we follow it through by all the big Siyam uh, Hashasim that comes from him. The mayor Dunn was born a very sickly child, and he was sick his entire life. His father was an Alexander Chassid. When he was a, a baby, the doctor said, you know, prepare the Hever Kaddish. And his father ran to the Alexander Rebbe. They wouldn't let him in. He broke the door down, literally broke the door down. And said, so the Rebbe, you have to do something for my son. And the Rebbe told him, you don't have to break any doors. Your son will be a God of Israel. And he survived. He was always at the brink of death, and he was always surviving. He was always jumping back. When they realized his greatness, he had a Zayda. The Zayda, before he died, made him take a Shvua. When he was seven years old, he might have never himself for limited time. She always felt bound by that Shvua, even though he was a cotton. But he felt that his das was already like Priyetes, with the of Shashat, and the Nidarim, Nidvakin, or whatever the case may be. Um, they couldn't find a Rebbe for him. Her mother sold all her jewelry. And when he was nine years old, he learned by the Nefesh Chaya. The Nefesh Chaya was the Lazar Vax. He was a Goan Oilam. Even though the Ragged Shavu, when he saw the Sefer Nefesh Chaya, he went through it in two seconds. He said, I saw two Chedushim in the Sefer. First, that you could name the Sefer after your mother, because it was named after his mother Chaya. And he said, the other Chedush in the Sefer was, it said that it was printed in uh, Petrikov. He said, I never knew there was a printing press in Petrikov. But that was the, the Ragatzah. But everyone knew that Nefesh Chaya was, a, was from the greatest Ga'inim in all of Europe. And by the time he turned 11, he said, I have nothing to teach you anymore. He went to Reb Shaya Lekutner. He learned Reb Shia Lekutner. He learned Reb Shia Lekutner until he was 13. When he was 13, they sent him to the Avni Nezer. The Avni Nezer, in typical Kotzka Polish, said, I don't want a kindergarten. And uh, he said to me, talk to me in learning. And he spoke to him several hours in learning. And he said, uh, you're in the yeshiva. You're in the yeshiva. He suffered his whole life. He was unbelievably sick. He married, he, well, by, they say that there's a pilpul, a three-hour pilpul that he gave when he was 13 by his bar mitzvah. They didn't let anyone sing in. Didn't have to look for a minya for benching, but a uh, mezuman afterwards, but uh, he said a three-hour pilpul. They said if Sheila couldn't have sat there and listened to the whole, the Abinezer listened to the whole pilpul. He married when he was 16 years old, which was not terribly uncommon to realize in those days there was a life expectancy of in the 40s, high 40s. Uh, at age 29, he was diagnosed with a serious machla. That there's no cure, I'll be derech at that for that today. And he was diagnosed with that machla. And he felt, he said, my life is not for myself, I live it for others. And uh, the only solution then, there weren't even any treatments, he had an extreme, there was a very radical surgery. And you're talking about surgery in the 1920s, right? They did it with can openers, however they did surgery. And uh, he had the surgery, he would have four or five of these radical surgeries. And uh, where the doctors told him then that it was available medicine then, that he had only a month to live, he would live another 36 years. And the entire time, he never stopped. He never stopped writing svarim, he never stopped teaching, he never stopped raising money. He said, because it's not my life, so it works with a different cheshmer. He's committed his life to the tzibah. In 1914, when World War I broke out, and everybody ran for their lives, he stayed. He said, anyway, what am I running that there's a machla in him that could kill him any second. So the only reason he's alive, he felt he's donating his life to the tzibur. So why am I running away and leaving everyone here alone? He stayed with all the people that couldn't run. Um, he had terrible personal tragedies. He had a son that was a Mashim that could go and that died. He had a daughter that fell under the influence of the communists. And uh, she went away. And uh, he was offered, when he was living dire poverty, to become Rav and Lodge. And he was offered a tremendous salary. He was Rav in a small town. He wouldn't go. And he told them the story of Rabbi Yaisi ben Kisma that it says, come and, live to, you know, come and live in our town, we'll give you all that money. He said, if you give me all the money in the world, I'm not coming. 
I'm only living with this Makam with this Bnei Taira. So how did Rabbi Yaisi and Kisma know they're not Bnei Taira? So if the first thing they offered him was money, he said they're not Bnei Taira. In 1912, he went to Eretz Yisrael, he wrote a Svarim, because he wanted to aim Taira to Taira's Eretz Yisrael. Um, he, in 1922, he came to America. He was in America. I think he was here for two years raising money for Yidden and Poland that were literally dying of hunger in the, in the wars, because after World War I, there was the Russian Revolution, the Polish Revolution, and the Polish Russian Revolution. Then they were just revolutioning. They didn't know who they were revolution. They were just, it was ongoing. And uh, the, the last part of his life, he gave over for being Mata Ragunas. And he ran into a lot of controversy. He said that he had, a, the, but people felt that he had a certain kayak to be Mata Ragunas. He said he's no different than a Gvir that could save someone's life. He's no different than, a, than a, a doctor that could save someone's life with surgery. If he has this kayak to be Matur Agunas, he's not stopping, and Itaka didn't stop till the day of his death. He, he kept on going. And he gave this keynote speech by the, by the, by the, by that, uh, he used, so you see him there. He's dressed, he had a very big tzura. Klai is a big, uh, big work, and he came there. So, you know, we think about why we're here. Who were these people, right? Why did he stay in Etsy's Road? Why did he stay in his little town? World War I, everybody ran. He stays back with his people. Because he said, if Hashem wants me here, this is my Kodesh HaKadosh. So you will just see this last piece of Tzvera Shloyma. He says, you do a... So I, I'm going to say it quickly because there's no time to really learn it inside. We all know the story of Rabbi Yehuda ben Seir, right? What's the story of Rabbi Yehuda ben Seir? They came to him and he, they, he told them that, right, you know, catch the guy, there's somebody going to your Shalayim. And, he's, and he's, he has no right, he's not, he's not Jewish, he's eating the carbon Pesach, and Rabbi Yehuda of Emsera said, ask the Sanhedrin, do you want uh, the tail? Right, the tail? And then he came and they asked him, who are you, who sent you, who, said you, who, who sent you here to the tail? He said, Rabbi Yehuda of Emsera, so they realized who he was. So they told Rabbi Yehuda of Emsera, you're all the way in the Tzivin, and your net is out there in Chutzlar, as so you were able to catch the imposter that was trying to go there. And Taisa says, why Taka didn't he go be Eul Regal? Because he had no Karka. Says it's very slim, you know what that meant? The Yudim Sayer said, where I am, that's the Kodesh HaKadosh. For whatever reason he had to stay home, this is my life, this is where I am. Wherever he is. And you see later that the Gemara says he could have been the Nasi, and he said, I don't need to be the Nasi. I'm the Nasi right here in my house. He says, that wherever the Banesha put me here, this is where I live. And later on it says that the B'nai Pseira gave up the Nasiyas to Hillel. The Gemara says in Masech Tzachim. They were the Nasiyim. And Hill came along and didn't know what to do with the lamb on, on, on Erev Pesach. How do you get, on Shabbos, Erev Pesach, how do you get the knife there? And Hill said, you stick the knife in the wool of the lamb on the outside. And, then, and the B'nai B'seirah said, oh, Hill, you knew that. We didn't know that. We give up our Nasius. You're the Nasi. Don't hold your breath for that to happen again. Right? We give up our Nasius. You're the Nasi. You do it. You go ahead. He says, this was the whole Kayach of, of Neb Seir. And that's why he had a Kayach of the carbon Pesach, even though he was so Rachuk. And even though he was so far from the carbon Pesach, he was part of the carbon Pesach. He says, that's where I'm going to be. That's where I'm going to stay. I had a Chavrusa. I want to finish with this. That he had a child that was very, very not well. And he had to travel for a surgery. I don't want to get into Pratim, not to give up too many details. And he had a pad. And on the pad he wrote like this. Travel to, uh, you know, Cincinnati for surgery. Pick up orange juice, okay? Bring MRI of child's lungs. Don't forget to bring extra shoelaces. Um, he, he, he wrote, and he would write, to, you know, like, like, try to call this asking to get through to this major, major doctor and tell him I have no insurance. And then he would write, also, make sure to take in the garbage can from the back. I said, what, <laughs> what are you doing? He said, I'm Maimon Ramuna Shalema. Okay? Yeah. That if the Rabbani Shalem helps me, I, I, I can do this doctor, I can do this surgery. If the Rabbani Shalem doesn't help me, I can't even take in the garbage I can't even buy juice. I want to put it on the same, this is what he told me, I'll never forget it. I want to put it on the same pad. I want to put it on the same pad to, to, to say like this. Look at Rabbani Shalem. If you're not with me, I can't do anything. I can't even take the garbage and I can't buy juice. I can't buy shoelaces. If you're with me, I can make it through the worst crisis in the world. And he could put it on the same pad. Daf could put it in the same Indian, wherever you are. And if you do that, we can in, imbue that in ourselves and in our children. And wherever we are, we're mocking the current Pesach in such a way that it's a hachana for the real. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.